We've done a great job at making our buildings much more energy efficient. From light bulbs to windows to more insulation, it's great. But we don't always account for the CO2 emissions required to make those materials. That's where embodied carbon comes in. When it comes to being eco-friendly, it's hard to be perfect, but we can always be just a little bit greener. Embodied carbon measures the material CO2 emissions through excavation, manufacturing, transportation, installation, use, and disposal. So you get the whole picture. That's how we should be comparing products, and that's where Chris Magwood comes in. He happens to be an expert on embodied carbon and just finished a research paper on his findings. So in part three, we'll talk to Chris about embodied carbon, about some cool products he's excited about, and also some little ways that you can get involved. So your research is on embodied carbon, correct? Yeah. What yeah. are you studying? You know, as I was starting to, you know, come up with these criteria for sustainable buildings, um, I worked on a book called Making Better Buildings, and the idea there was to look at all those different ways you could look at buildings from planet health, people health, energy efficiency, like all of those different things, and kind of try to rate the materials. As I was thinking about, well, what would those criteria be? I came across this notion of embodied carbon, which is what are the emissions associated with creating a material in the first place? So, you know, you uh, need some cement, you've got to go harvest some limestone, so there's emissions that happen with that, you've got to transport that, you've got to burn that limestone, you've got to crush it, you've got to mix it with gravel, get it to a job site. So there's a whole pile of emissions associated with all of those things. Right. And so embodied carbon is looking at what's the total impact of everything that was emitted in making a material in the first place. This was an add-on to my list of these are sustainable building criteria. I found a database that had come out in England. I was like, okay, here's these numbers. I can use them really easily. I'll just plug them in. And then as I started doing that, I was like, wow, some of these numbers are really, really big and some are really small. And, and even in the same product category, you could have ones with like a huge carbon footprint or a tiny carbon footprint. And so that got me thinking I should look at the buildings we're doing, I should add all of these up for the materials we're using. And I started to get some really interesting answers, uh, including some negative answers, which were kind of surprising to me because some materials have enough carbon in the material itself, basically plant materials, absorb CO2 out of the atmosphere to make themselves. And then if you put that into a building and stop it from decomposing and going back to the atmosphere, that's actually sort of like a, a negative emission. It's a, it's a drawdown of, of carbon. And so I decided to go back to school because I thought I'm getting really interesting answers. Interesting indeed. One of his findings is that the typical low rise building has high upfront embodied carbon. In 2017, the US built 241 million meters squared of new low rise buildings. If we operate business per usual, that adds 54 million tons of CO2 emissions, or the equivalent of 15 coal plants. If we swap out for carbon storing materials, we can store 36 million tons of CO2, the equivalent of removing 10 coal plants. That is a huge swing. Add 15 coal plants or remove 10, just by switching the materials we use. And that's in one year, in one country, and we're only talking low-rise residential buildings. Imagine the numbers if we built all our buildings this way, worldwide. The, the difference in the impact it can be enormous. It can be, you know, buildings as like one of the biggest drivers of climate change, or possibly buildings as one of the biggest possible drawdowns to sort of reverse climate change. So it's, you know, those those two things are pretty opposite. And so, you know, I'm really keen on trying to push towards the the solution side, not the problem side. <laughs> Thank you for that, I yeah. appreciate that. So what's an example? I know insulation is one you kind of often, I think you say yeah. an example, right? So high an example would be any of the, the foam-based insulation. So whether it's spray foam or beadboard or extruded polystyrene, any of those have a big carbon footprint, which, you know, if you think about it logically, it makes sense. It's like all the impacts of extracting oil 
you know, the, yeah. all those emissions, all the emissions of processing it, quite a few of them use greenhouse gases as blowing agents to put the bubbles in the foam. And so, you know, overall, you end up with a, a material with a, a really high impact versus basically anything that's made from plants. So that could be something conventional like cellulose insulation, which is ground up recycled newspaper. So all of that newsprint fiber is about half carbon by weight. So if you put it in your wall, you're sort of storing carbon. And then the kinds of things that we're really excited about in Endeavor, like you know, straw and hemp and cork and you know, those sorts of materials, those plant-based materials that you, know, you can replace the conventional materials that have the high carbon footprint with those ones and, and basically you know, flip it so that your building is now a carbon storage device instead of an emitter. In broad terms, you could almost just replace some of these materials with other materials. Like you don't have to change the whole process. It's not like other industries where you have to make these wide sweeping changes. Yeah, no, it, right? it's, there, there's a lot that you could do, just straight material substitution. And you know, it sounds kind of kooky now, like, oh, we, you know, let's insulate all these buildings with straw. But you know, it's, that's no crazier than saying, let's insulate them with oil with bubbles in it. You know, like there's, there's actually, it was a lot harder to come up with styrofoam, you know, and those types of insulations than it is ways to process straw. Certainly in Europe, they're really starting to take off. There's lots of prefabricated straw bale wall manufacturers and people doing press straw panels and, and all kinds of things like that. And, and I think the opportunity for that is huge, you know, to bring manufacturing back here to help farmers to you know have local manufacturing of materials that actually benefit the climate so yeah I'm, I, it really excites me is there a product or a technique or anything that now that you're just excited about that you just kind of something newer that you're like oh this is this is cool I, yeah. I, yeah yeah I'm really excited there are some companies working on sort of growing building materials there's a a material called Mycofoam from a company called Ecovative, and it's literally an insulation that is um, mycelium mushroom roots. So they're oh. they're grown in a in a chopped straw medium, and it turns out to be something. You know, if I showed it to you, it looked sort of just like styrofoam, feels like styrofoam, has the same R value as styrofoam, but it's grown. It didn't take, you know. It didn't take us going out into nature and messing with things to do it. Right. You know, it was grown in sight. There's a, a company called Biomason that's growing bricks in the same way. They have a microbe that they put in a sand base and it basically excretes calcium carbonate that, you know, glues the sand together. Cool. So that whole notion to me is really exciting. I mean, I love the, the agricultural byproduct side of things, but the, you know, the notion that we could actually not mess with nature and, and you know, grow a lot of the things we need, kind of take advantage of nature's processes to, to actually make materials that way is, that's really exciting. But yeah, if you could replace just styrofoam with something based on mushrooms. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So what, what keeps you up at night? What's the one thing you're just like, okay, we need to figure <laughs> this out. Yeah. I mean, the thing that keeps me up at night is just like how, Everything is right about this stuff. Like the, already, you can see that the, the price is is reasonable, even at the scale it's at now. It's easy to do. It's healthier for people. It's healthier for the planet. It's good for the climate. It's like if you have all of those positive sales pitches, yeah, why isn't everybody excited about it? it seems like a no-brainer. Like when you start to go through it, it totally does. Distribution, yeah. which is obviously, yeah. like we said, is the hardest problem. But yeah. like that will come with more interest. The fact that you can just be like, listen, guys, just. Don't stop using this, use this. Yeah. And there is talk about doing that sort of like a, a nutrition label for, for building materials. There are people working on that. So yeah, when you're at that big box store and you're looking at two or three products that have similar uses, you could actually go, oh, there's the carbon footprint of this one and it off gases these things and then compare that to this one. And, and uh, so there is you know work on that. And yeah. hopefully that is one of the kinds of things that could make a difference. Well, I definitely think you should check out the Endeavor website. They got lots of cool courses. Uh, they're always, they're releasing some more videos. They're doing all sorts of stuff right now, but check them out. Think about sustainable building. Um, I think it's really cool, but I think that there's just a lot of options in there that people people can do, you know? Things that can, even for like DIYers like myself, if you're at home just doing some renos, you're just like, Hempcrete, I'm gonna really think about that a lot more now, yeah. you know? Or even on a really simple level, paints, you know? like. Don't be fooled by no VOC paints. Like those things are not good for you. They're not healthy for you. They're not good for the planet, but there are so many great natural paint options. Like just next time you're, you know, wanting to paint a room, 
figure out what's out there. Go to our website, look at other sites and figure out like what's a good healthy natural paint and, and make that kind of start. It's really easy to, to sort of like get a foot in the door that way. There's a great quote by Maya Angelou that says, when you know better, you do better. Well, now we know better. So on your next project or reno, think about swapping out some materials. It really is a no-brainer. Tippity tap that like button, hit subscribe if you're a greener like me, and we'll see you next time. I'm not looking for perfection here, people. Let's just get a little bit better than yesterday.